Teach me about the Great Lakes. Teach me about the Great Lakes. Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a twice monthly podcast in which I, a Great Lakes novice, ask people who are smarter and harder working than I am to teach me all about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton and I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and I'm joined today by Megan Gunn. Megan, it's been a minute. How's it going? It's good. The sun is shining. The days are getting longer. I am ready for spring. Uh, we talked an episode or two ago with Dr. Richard Root about how the winters are getting warmer, and now that's kind of terrifying, but today, I'm not minding it. Yeah. This is kind of the climate change <laughs> deal, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's no good, but it sure is nice outside. That is fantastic. Glad to hear it. So, Megan, we are going to feature a Lakey nominee this week, and I think you had a Lakey nominee that you wanted to talk about. Is that right? Yes, I do. And the Lakey nominee I want to talk about is Alex Hill in Mapping the Great Lakes. Mapping the Great Lakes. And so this is a cool series at um, Great Lakes Now, or Teach Me About the Great Lakes Great Lakes News Partners, uh, Detroit Public Television, the Great Lakes Now. And so Alex, it looks like what he does is he creates kind of each month, oh, not February, man, Alex, time to get on it. He creates these cool <laughs> maps, right, of the Great Lakes, where he takes just a little bit of day. It's little tidbits is what I would call it. And we'll put a link in the show notes, but you can go to greatlakesnow.org slash author slash Alice slash Alex. We'll just put the link in the show notes. And um, and uh, look at it. Like, yeah, snowfall in the snow belt. My favorite one that I was looking at after we started looking at this link was actually in November. Um, very timely for the uh, decorative gourd season, my friends. Um, he mapped pumpkin production in the Great Lakes. So this is really cool. And it turns out in the Great Lakes, if you're getting a pumpkin that's from the Great Lakes watershed, it's coming from Michigan. Because uh, there's a lot of little orange dots in Michigan um, and, and uh, within the watershed. And then Illinois, it turns out, is a very big pumpkin producer as well. So that is cool. This is fantastic work. It was not a lakey winner, but it is very worthy nominee. So that's that's good. So, Megan, World Water Day is coming up in just a few weeks, March 22nd. And we started thinking about uh, what water means. I think water is pretty, like, you're a diver, right? And so I feel like you've spent a lot of time kind of in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of meaningful. How did you get started with water stuff? So, it all started when I was <laughs> a, a little girl. Um, grew up with Lake Michigan right in my back door. So, um in my back door, in my backyard. And so we spent a in lot your of back time. Door. That's actually a problem at that point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit, just a little bit of a problem. Um, but yeah, just spending all the time. I was a water baby. I've been swimming since I was like two. And so just, what? I love the water. Yeah. My parents, my parents wanted to make sure that I knew how to swim. Um, Cause they had a, they had an empty pool in their apartment complex. Um, but they, yeah. So they, they ended up getting me swimming lessons and then never filled the pool. The bills for a pool, especially in the middle, not, not that cheap. So I don't blame them at all. That's fantastic. Well, great. I'm mean, really excited to talk about water and what it means to people, but we're going to do it in an interesting way. This was recommended by our good friend, Ann Moser um, at Wisconsin Sea Grant. And she said, uh, you know, we put out a call in the Teach Me About the Great Lakes newsletter, which you can find at teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.substack.com. Said, hey, do we know any cool artists? And Ann reached out with this one. We're going to speak to her name is Sarah Fitzsimons, and we'll speak with her in just a second. today is Sarah Fitzsimons. She's an associate professor of sculpture in the art department at the University of Wisconsin, and she does fascinating work with uh, water, uh, which you don't necessarily think of sculpture and water as going together, or I don't, because when I think sculpture, I think of uh, the thinker, and I think of a certain <laughs> part of Michelangelo's David, and that's it. That's my that's my sculpture knowledge. So I'm excited to talk to her. Sarah, how are you this uh, fine, warm afternoon? Oh, I'm doing quite well. And thank you so much for the invitation to be part of the podcast. Yeah, we're glad to have you on. So let's start with that. So how does how does one become a sculpt sculptor? What what led to that? And then and then we'll talk about maybe in a few minutes about like how water is integrated into your work. But but just the basics. How do you become a sculptor? What is that how does that happen? That's a good question. I think I didn't really start making sculpture until college. I um I started learning how to make things. So uh, sculpture, first of all, is fascinating. It encompasses everything that's with three dimensions. So um, it's not focused on one material. We learn how to make things out of wood, metal, fabric, um, dirt, um, anything with three dimensions I consider in the realm of sculpture. So I really fell in love with the process of making things in the physical world, um, as opposed to making an image of something 
or writing about something, just making objects and um, installations. And um, I've been working with ideas around water since about 2003, 2004. Um, and I, I can I can mention a little bit about that. If yeah, you know. yeah. So that's interesting. So how, yeah, so how did you get started working in water and why, I think, did you get started in working in, in water? Well, I think, you know, like Megan, I grew up in on the shore of one of the Great Lakes. So I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, from a um, suburb just east of Cleveland called Euclid. And it was a 10 minute walk down my little suburban street to Lake Erie. And so I grew up seeing that on a, if not daily, then biweekly basis. And it was just part of my upbringing. And um, I didn't realize how rare and special that was, I think, until I moved away and I wasn't living near this huge body of water. Because uh, one of the things I realized in later years is that I, I missed that huge horizon. You know, um, to me, a lake was something where you didn't see the other side. <laughs> and so um, I always think of the smaller ones. I live in Madison now and they seem more like big puddles um, <laughs> than uh, lakes compared to the Great Lakes. So, um, at, you know, after growing up in, in Cleveland, I went on to live in a number of different places from um, southwest Texas, southeastern Ohio. I was in Yellowstone National Park for um, some time. I um, also lived for a number of years in Los Angeles. And that's where I started really doing some more self-conscious work with water, was living by the Pacific Ocean. And so when you're moving around, was that, so I'm in academia, right? So I think of moving around is you're going to graduate school yeah. and uh, then you're going to a postdoc, even though you didn't want to do a postdoc. And then you're at 23 different jobs while you try to find the <laughs> one job. And then hopefully you found the one job and then your kids are old and you're like, mm -hmm. what have I done with my life? Um, or something like that. <laughs> and and that's great. Um, but so, so sculptor training, is that like a graduate program deal or you just like sit around and sculpt? I don't know. Like, uh, and, and if so, are you just sort of following your muse, uh, you know, metaphysical or, or metaphorical or, or what's the deal with that? Well, you are correct. I did move around for a number of different art residencies, although I did work um, three summers in Yellowstone National Park just to, for love and fun of being there. Um, but then I eventually I moved out to Los Angeles to start a graduate program at UCLA focused on sculpture. And while I was there, I was lucky enough to be able to take a number of geomorphology lab classes. So I got to work with um, a wave tank and was doing a lot of field work. And to me, to me, sculpture and field work have a lot in common. There's really this focus on materiality and the importance of material and understanding material material and also site. And those would be like the two big things I see in terms of crossover with um, the earth sciences and sculpture is the importance of site, the importance of material, importance of scale, and even time and duration. And so that was really um, an important time for me. And while I was living there, it was the first time I'd ever lived anywhere with tides. And I'd never been that close to that phenomenon. And so the first sculpture I built out there was um, taking into account this amazing fact to me that sometimes the water was completely concealing part of the land and sometimes it was revealed. And that just seemed like such an incredible thing, both biologically, geomorphologically, that's a word, <laughs> and metaphorically. And so I built this um, sculpture to exist in that tidal zone where it would be covered with water some of the times and other times revealed. Um, and that was, yeah, that was the first piece I, huh. I built. And it was a bed. It was actually a, a full-size queen size bed out of wood kind of bolted apart and then I welded these metal anchors and the whole thing could be broken apart take it down at low tide install it and then the water would come up and over so it would be this marker to act like um like one of the rocks that sometimes would be revealed and sometimes would not be revealed but I was I was thinking about this metaphorical space of you know we all spend about eight hours a day if we're lucky sleep on a bed it's this other method of consciousness and it's a daily rhythm of back and forth between being awake, being asleep, being awake, being asleep. And so I was comparing that to this rhythm of the tides, concealing the water, revealing. And I was thinking about, you know, the, the water covering the land almost like a, a blanket. Or But there was this daily natural process that we also partook of um, in different ways in terms of our own rhythms. And then after, after it was out there, I, I actually brought the bed back and and that ended up being my bed. I didn't have a bed out there. I just moved there. No kidding. So that was my bed. Was the wood in good shape then, or was it kind of a warped situation? No, it was in good shape. I used about 10 layers of um, a polyurethane boat varnish over the wood. So that it was just out there, you know, 48 hours 
couple tidal cycles. And, um, and then every night when I would go to sleep, it was this brief memory of, oh, this bed has been under the Pacific Ocean. And I liked that connection as I was falling asleep. Um, that was sort of a little bit of mystery in my daily life. Yeah, you think about like the idea of the dream world and, and the nether regions and, and yeah, and so you're, you're sort of entering that space. That, that's really interesting. Um, we're, so you're an applied material scientist in some ways is what you are, right? When it comes to this. So you have an idea. Oh, I like that term. And then you got to figure I out how to make it work, right? And that seems like it might be a challenge in and of it itself. It's like you have to have the inspiration and then you have to have, then the perspiration part is the, uh, is the actually, how do you do this? That seems like it can be very challenging at times. Well, that's the great thing about, about sculpture that um, it's always a different challenge. And, I certainly don't do it all alone. You know, it, for example, these um, these water books I've been making. I had the idea for making this piece. I didn't know how I was going to make it. So the, one of the first things I do will be to do some research and to meet with some fabricator, someone who's used to working with that material, and I'll get recommendations, and we do a lot of prototypes. Um, so a, a lot of my projects do involve uh, long periods of research and development in terms of what will work and what won't. And maybe that's similar to the scientific process in certain ways. Sarah, so speaking of water books, um, can we talk about your water library? What, what is a water library and like, how did you come up with this idea and where's, I'm so fascinated by the entire process. Well, that's a great question. And, um, it all goes back to um, Ann Moser, who recommended me for this, this program. <laughs> so when I first took the job here in in Madison, I, um, let's see, where to start? Uh, I was moving out of the country. I was living in Lisbon, Portugal at the time, moving to Wisconsin. And one of the first things that someone told me when I got here within the first few months was that, you know, we have a water library on campus. And I thought, What? <laughs> First of all, I'd never heard that term, and um, I just started turning this idea around in my head. It seemed so richly poetic. I thought, well, I mean, water and libraries don't seem to mix. That would be bad if there was a flood. Um, what does that mean? And it, it seemed like this amazing um, thing. And of course, I figured it was something a little bit more prosaic, but that was how it started, um, the existence of the water library we have on campus. Eventually, I went to to visit and uh, got to meet Anne, and um, and that's been wonderful um, to get to know her, the work through Sea Grant, et cetera. But based on that, I started thinking, well, what would my water library look like? And um, I started thinking about emotional connections we develop to bodies of water. So, for example, when I left Los Angeles, I, I ended up moving back across the country to take a teaching position in Ohio. And I was very sad to leave the Pacific Ocean. I'd been there for years. Um, so right before leaving, I actually filled up a small little container of water, put it on the dashboard of my car. And as I drove east, I had that little bit of the ocean with me. Um, and, and so I started thinking about, well, what if I could make a book and maybe those water books would compose my own water library? And so I started with my own water biography. So I thought about since I was born and grew up, what were those bodies of water I've lived by that I came to have uh, any kind of personal emotional connection to? And so I have a series of about 12, 12 books, and, um, and, I can, and I've made them all, and they're all varying sizes, um, not exactly proportional, or that would be ridiculous, the Pacific <laughs> Ocean next to like a small creek in Northeast Ohio. But um, so I started making the books. It took a few years of prototyping because uh, I am teaching, so I'm doing this really part-time. But I finally came up with a method where um, the book is acrylic. And um, I thought about using glass, but glass was going to be too beautiful and too precious. And I wanted the, the water books to be valuable for the water they contained and not because they were some rare, precious object. And plus, I wanted to get them in the library. That was my secret goal. <laughs> um, so I wanted them to be able to be handled where you could pick them up and open them and check them out and that they wouldn't leak and, you know, wouldn't be too easy to damage. So eventually I, I ended up with um, working with a couple different fabricators. I found a local one who I worked with quite well. And um, I have about 20 of the books. They've been in a couple different exhibitions. And most recently, right before the pandemic started, they were on display at an exhibition at the Chazen Museum of Art here in Madison. And in connection with that show, um, we got 
three books um, curated into the library. So I had to work with the library registrars, a couple of whom at first were suspicious they were going to leave. <laughs> and so you couldn't get in into the library at first. That would not be great on like the stacks along with the like 19th century tome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so now the Atlantic Ocean is in the Kohler Art Library. And, you know, these have call numbers. You can look them up. Um, that one is just on reserve. But then uh, Wisconsin Water Library here on campus does have Lakes Superior and Michigan, and those are in theory available to be checked out. But I'll be honest, this was right before the pandemic when this happened, and I don't think Ann and I have worked out how that all the how that's going to work yet. Yeah. But so for our listeners, so what they look like, I mean, you can see them on Ann's webpage, which we are uh, not Ann, uh, Sarah's webpage. Sorry about that. Thank you, Ann, uh, on Sarah's webpage. But what they 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 look like clear books, essentially, maybe the size of like a, uh, some of them are maybe textbook size, you know, like like freshman year textbook size. Um, and some of them are slightly different size and you look at them and, and they're filled. So they're filled with the literal water of these places, or yes. at least this is your claim. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I love this. I, I love the idea of a water biography. All I've been doing since you mentioned the idea of a personal water biography is thinking of the critical waterways in my life of the Mississippi river, the Gulf of Mexico of Wolf Creek in Mississippi and the red river in Mississippi and the broad river in Georgia. And you know, the, the Tampa Bay and uh, all these other little creeks and stuff that have, that you're right. You derive meaning from them. Sugar Creek, which runs through uh, 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 Turkey run state park where my kids like to play, even though the sign says don't play in the water. And, uh, <laughs> And, and like you think about how meaningful water can be and, you know, you can think about this in primal terms, right? We come from the water uh, as a species or you can think about it in mystical terms, you know, with baptism and other water related ceremonies. And, and so I, I'm just really struck by this idea. I think it's really great. But I also like the idea of taking the book. Here's the water book and you can look at it. And when you look at the different places, you got the Pacifics, you got some lakes uh, of various greatness and, and what have you. Uh, do they, I'm curious, do they look the same? Does the water look the same or can you tell differences? Not that, and does it matter? I guess. Yeah, they, they look pretty similar. Um, you know, at first I wasn't treating the water at all and some, you know, they would start to grow small things. Of course, water has organisms in it. And, um, so I have sort of two strains of them. One, one set of books, I've actually boiled the water first before I put it into the book I can't remember which ones I, I have in the library at this point, because I didn't want them all to just, you know, be solidified with algae. So there were some copies that I did boil the water. Um, I'm still on the fence about that. But, um, but you know, you talk about these different locations, and um, now I wish I had one I could hold. I'm going to go grab. Do you mind if I'm just going to grab one really quick, because it's easier to. Oh, I don't mind at all. No. Pacific. This is one of the bigger, the bigger sizes, and um, you know you can, we can open them. The covers are slightly frosted, and so is the spine. So there's this division between the the interior pages. It's kind of two pages are clear, um, and then the only text on the books is on the the spine where it says uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, I have some in other languages now. I spent a year in in Portugal, so I had a, a few books I, I did over there. But one thing I really like about them that I, I haven't had a chance to do yet because the pandemic hit right when this was going to be going is to have an exhibition of these books and then to do a public reading where we invite a small group to come and then we can take the books down and sort of pass them around and tell stories. Um, and I could start with certain stories I have about living near different bodies of water. And then I'd be very interested to hear from other people, their connections and memories and personal stories oh this is um, super I love that and so, so I, much. yeah i'm heading i'm heading out to oregon state university in the fall to do a visiting artist um mini residency and an exhibition and i think in connection to that show i'm hoping to do a reading and maybe get a book out into that library as well uh, because honestly in my personal water bi biography collection i have everything from you know the pacific ocean where um, I used to live in Los Angeles to a really small book I don't have on me right now, but it's um, Dugway Brook. It's a tiny bluestone brook that runs through 
Lakeview Cemetery in Northeast Ohio, where I used to go running a lot in this gorgeous large cemetery and where my father is now buried. And so other types of memories connected to that, that small stream. I have a question. I'm very intrigued about, like, because water does contain living organisms, do, will your books ever open? Like, will there, will it be funky for lack of a better word? Like if they're like, if they ever get cracked open or like, does the frosting on the cover help prevent the algae growth? Is the boiling enough? It's just so interested in what, what's happening on the inside. That's a really good question. And so far it seems like the boiling has been enough. Um, and I've mostly been thinking about, you know, say a, an art collection or a library collection would like to have a book in their collection and they don't want it to grow a lot of algae. <laughs> Um, so the boiling has seemed to work well for that. I didn't want to put, I didn't want to put chemicals. I wanted it really to just be the water. So the boiling was the way I've found around that. Although I still wouldn't bet on even a, with this water being boiled, if we had this in direct sunlight for a while, something still might grow. <laughs> so, um, but so far it's, it's been a couple years and I haven't seen much growth. On the other hand, I don't have one with me right at the second, but I do have a few copies where certain interesting patterns of algae are starting to grow on the interior surface as you as you asked and i think it's really beautiful it's like another kind of text that starts to change in the book so um, there's these two strains of them that i'm i'm still thinking about how that works um because some of the algae is quite beautiful yeah that's amazing you talk about the death of the author in literature or whatever, right? Well, here we're the, here we're the death of the author. But with that, we have the, the life of the algae kind of making the deal. This is great. Uh, so listeners out there, if you're, I'm really into this. If you want to think about like the stories that we tell about water too, you can go to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes.com slash 53, episode 53, where we spoke with an English professor, Rachel Haverlock from University of Illinois, Chicago. And she collects people's stories. So this is, you know, actual audio stories um, related to water. But here we have sort of a different version of that, that physical manifestation. And I can't wait to see, I hope you invite Wisconsin Sea Grant to your uh, reading, if and when you have that, because they'll get Bonnie out there, Willison, who does all those cool podcasts and videos and stuff, and they'll do a really cool thing on it. And, and since I won't be there, because I'm going to go to Madison, um, uh, <laughs> it'll be, uh, but I can't wait to see that. What a fascinating idea, the sort of embedded meaning uh, within those books. That's that's really super. I think also, I know that Anne has mentioned to me that sometimes if she goes, she travels to do any outreach talks, in connection with the water library, she's brought the books with her so that you could pass these around. And you're literally you're holding a body of water in your hand in some ways, which I think is really an interesting conversation um, starter or accelerant. Uh, I've also done an, an installation with these in a church in Switzerland that I'm quite interested in pursuing in the future. Um, in in connection with a couple of the books um i placed them in a small alpine church in a small village in switzerland as part of an art exhibition where a number of artists were were invited and commissioned to propose work for a series of churches and other locations in switzerland as part of something called the alps art academy a wonderful residency there and i really liked the resonance i i wrote to the local parish where this, this church was situated and asked for permission to put a copy of two books right up behind the altar next to the Bible on one of the pews. And they, they accepted that. And so I had a, a copy of the Rabiusa River, which is the local river that runs by the church in the Alpine region. And then also the um, Atlantic Ocean, which is the final destination of that river over there. And I, I paired those two books together, actually thinking about a quote from, I think it's Ecclesiastes, I'll paraphrase, which is, all rivers run to the sea, but the sea is not full, and the rivers return to their source. And I, I, I thought it was interesting, because on one level, it could be talking about the water cycle of the rain coming down, the rivers running to their source in the sea, and then evaporating and going back. But of course, it's, it's also speaking to um, a more metaphorical, spiritual uh, reference as well. And so I, I thought those resonated well sitting in the church in a really contemplative environment where people could walk in, pick them up, look at them. And I'm definitely be interested in the future, you know, churches or, or synagogues or places of, of worship are really one of the few places many people go on a regular basis and still pick up a physical book, whether it's a song book or a, a holy book. And so that's another interest possibly for the future in terms of a public work. I mean, 
imagine a World Water Day where you have a, a choir or a group of people each holding part of that body of water in their hand um, as part of a performance. It could be interesting. Did in the process of creating these sculptures and going through this whole process where you're sourcing water, you're sourcing materials, you're thinking about your relationship uh, to the water, did that, did that change the way that you think? I mean, think about these water bodies. Did that change your connection in any way? And if so, how? One, one thing it really made me aware of is um, how heavy water is. You know, to get this Pacific water <laughs> back to Wisconsin, I waded into the Pacific Ocean with two giant gallon jugs, filled up that water, and then I had to haul it back uphill half a mile away to my car. And it just makes me think about, it made me really think about how inefficient it is to transport water by bottle, <laughs> how heavy it is. Um, so I started thinking about circulation, both natural and, and bottled. It just so happened those gallon jugs I was using were like Fiji water from Trader Joe's, which again, why am I buying that in Southern California? And so there's another tangent there as well. I started thinking about that. Um, and then I'm packing the water into my checked luggage and flying back with it. And that is heavy. And, and then in terms of just how I think about the bodies of water, I guess just on a general level, it connects me with the memories of being in those places. I mean, I'm looking over my computer here and I have about 50 different jugs of water from various places I've brought back with me over the past few years, um, kind of sitting there waiting to be put into books. And um, it's an interesting collection. Um, some have bits of sediment in the bottom or sand, but, but they also hold these, these memories of, of being in these places. Speaking of memories and places, you also make water quilts. How does that work? So the quilt is, is actually just um, one giant quilt that I made. Um, it's a quilt of the Pacific Ocean. And this was also connected to the fact I was I moved to Wisconsin to take this job over a decade ago um, after living on ocean coasts for a long time. And I thought, well, I want to bring some part of the ocean with me to Wisconsin. I want to remake it. So I ended up making this giant about 21 by 23 foot quilt. It took about five years. Um, once in a while, I'd hire assistants if I had extra funding. If not, it was just me. And I learned how to quilt. This is my first quilt. I had done a couple little baby quilts to practice, but I knew I wanted to tap into this um, kind of Midwestern tradition of quilting. And I, I worked with the cartography library to get really high quality maps because the quilt is based on the topography of the Pacific. So each 1,000 meters deeper was a change in color. There's about nine different colors. It's all applique and it's machine and hand quilted. Um, and then the quilting lines are the surface currents. So I was taking NASA data about ocean surface currents and then all of the quilting lines are going over the topography um, in terms of the, the surface current pattern. So over the course of five years, my hands really touched every little part of the Pacific. I knew that topography or the bathymetry really well. Um, and then it was, it was something that was also meant to be used. You can drag it home and use it. Although it's so big, it's really hard to fit in the bedroom, but I wanted it to be oversized. I thought it won't seem like the Pacific unless it's giant. So, um, and I was thinking about, you know, the comparison between water and fabric, you know, they both flow, they both can cover, conceal, reveal. And the idea for this piece really happened as I was flying over the ocean to move back to the U.S. to take this job. I was looking down on my lap at this blue United blanket and then looking out the window at the ocean and thinking about, huh, ocean kind of covering the land like a, like a blanket quilt moving back to the Midwest. Let's make a giant quilt. <laughs> but it was, it was such a pleasure to be working on this in the, yeah, like in the middle of a Wisconsin winter, I would purposely work on the South Pacific to, and I would listen to podcasts about that part of the ocean. And um, Now that you're back in the Midwest, will you make one of the Great Lakes? Or is that not going to happen because it is a lengthy process? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I will do another one. I've done a couple small sketches. Um, there's other things I think I'm more interested to do with the Great Lakes. Yeah, that the quilt was... I wanted to make it as big as possible. And since I can't really go bigger than the Pacific, I don't know that I want to do any smaller ones. Once you've uh, done the Pacific quilt. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. 
Well, Sarah, this is fascinating. I'm just obsessed with this, and I'm going to be thinking about your work as I sleep tonight on my regular bed, just from <laughs> Ikea. Uh, not a, I guess yours was a water bed, wasn't it? Just a different one from like the 1970s version of the water bed. Um, uh, but, but, uh, and it's just the, the depths of people's connections with water. I think there's a lot of power in that. And I think there's a lot to explore there in the Great Lakes because when we spoke with Rachel and now we've spoken with you, you know, when we spoke with Sapna Sharma. Uh, I'll put the episode number in the show notes. She talked a lot about the meaning of lake ice, especially among indigenous cultures. Um, although also to like people who used to play hockey, uh, you know, on a frozen lake, right? And so there's just depths and depths of meaning. And I think that seeing your work and the way that you take that and represent it in the physical and, you know, ask people to interact with that. And ask people to reflect on it. I think that's really fascinating. But that's actually not why we invited you here on Teach Me About the Great Lakes this week. The reason that we invited you on Teach Me About the Great Lakes is to ask you two questions. The first one is this. If you could have a great donut for breakfast or a great sandwich for lunch, which would you choose? I think I have to go with the sandwich. Yeah, but maybe it would be a breakfast sandwich for lunch. <laughs> that would be my You choice. see, people try to, no, this is, I mean, I'll accept it. It's fine. But people are always trying to, you know, game the system here. It's a very straightforward question. Um, okay, so a breakfast sandwich. So if I'm going to go to, uh, um, you're in Wisconsin, you're, you're in Wisconsin, you're in Madison, right? I'm going to go to Madison and I'm going to get myself a really good sandwich, be it breakfast or otherwise. Where should I go? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, my first impulse is just to say my husband makes fantastic fried eggs and I often end up having that as a sandwich because I'm running out the door for breakfast with the fried egg and toast. But, um, so maybe I, no, that's great. We won't, we won't put a link to your address in the show notes because who knows what kind of creepy people are out there. Um, but, uh, fantastic. You're not the first person to call their own number on the sandwich recommendation, which is fine. It just means I will travel the country and visit people's houses and they will feed me sandwiches. I don't see what the problem is, frankly. (laughs) And our next question is, what is a special place in the Great Lakes that you'd like to share with our audience? And what makes it special? I would like to propose two places. So I guess first, I have this love of Lake Erie since I grew up there. And um, my fa- one of my favorite spots is right where the mouth of the Cuyahoga River meets Lake Erie in Cleveland. There's a lovely place called... Um, Whiskey Island, I think it was originally in Prohibition used for bootlegging, but now it's become part of the uh, Metro Park system of Northeast Ohio, and it's just a lovely park. There's also a restaurant, but you can see the big ore freighters coming into the river right off the lake, great place for sunsets. Um, But then the, the second thing I wanted to mention is I was 40 years old before I was ever up in northern Lake Michigan. It's the cleanest I've ever seen a lake up by Sleeping Bear Dunes, and I can't believe I was 40 years old before I ever knew lake water could be that clean and that beautiful, stunning, beautiful. So two places. There we go. That is fantastic. Yeah. And um, we talk about that a lot. Yeah. Lake Michigan, and that's because of the muscles, right? Um, The invasive muscles. But the trade-off is, you know, it's like we talked about climate earlier. Yeah, you got some nice, some beautiful, clear water uh, and sleeping bear dunes, which is, I've not been there, but it's supposed to be a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, Sarah Fitzsimons, associate professor of uh, sculpture in the Department of Art and Cleveland native, or at least Cleveland born. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on and teaching us all about the Great Lakes. Well, that was fascinating. I'm not an artist, Megan, I will be honest. Um, but I, I, it's such an interesting perspective on the world. And, and then it's worth considering the artist perspective, I think. And I learn a lot whenever I talk to somebody like that. I know. And it just, just the idea of like having the book reading or having a book reading and then having everybody share their connection to that specific body of water. That's like really powerful because everybody is going to have a different story. Um, but you and you don't know those pieces until you get a chance to just sit down and talk to people. Yeah, I wonder about our listeners. Actually, listeners, why don't you do that? Why don't you send us an email? Teach me about the Great Lakes at gmail dot com. Tell me what is your tell us what is your water story? Or you can call the hotline. We got a what is that seven six five four nine six i i s g. Four nine six I I S G seven six five four nine six I I S G. Leave us a voicemail. We'll play it on air if you want. Uh, tell us what is what is. Tell us a cool story about your connection with water. 
Teach Me About the Great Lakes is brought to you by the fine people at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. We encourage you to check out the great work we do at iicgrant.org and at ILIN Sea Grant on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Teach Me About the Great Lakes is produced by Hope Charters, Carolyn Foley, Megan Gunn, and Reedy Miles. Ethan Chitty is our associate producer and fixer, and our super fun podcast artist by Joel Davenport. The show is edited by the awesome Quinn Rose, and I encourage you to check out her work at aspiringrobot.com. If you have a question or comment about the show, please email it to teachmeaboutthegreatlakes at gmail.com or leave a message on our hotline at 765-496-IISG. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Teach Great Lakes. Thanks for listening and keep grading those lakes. Try.